This PowerPoint is over Chapter 9. It covers the central nervous system and it corresponds with your Chapter 9 study guide. Before we begin, let me state that a lot of the topics that will be discussed in this chapter are going to be superficially covered. Uh, there, please refer to the study guide to see which, which uh, concepts I expect you guys to know. Uh, but there's a lot of vocabulary that, uh, that comes from this chapter. So most of the test questions, most of what I'm expecting you guys to know is kind of some anatomical and, and vocabulary. The central nervous system is divided, or we can divide the central nervous system into two parts. Uh, when we talk about the cellular matter, that part can be divided into what we call gray and white um, based off its color. And the gray matter and white matter has that color based off of what type of neurons are found within that tissue. So when we refer to the central nervous system, we're talking about both the brain and the spinal cord. And the gray matter that's found in the brain and the spinal cord is the unmyelinated nerve cell bodies. So we have all the cell bodies tend to cluster together and these are, are depicted by that, that grayish color, right? So our dendrites, our axon terminals, the somas of the cell. But the axons themselves of those nerves, those are all myelinated, and hence that's why they appear white. So when we look at the different regions and cross sections and you see a white versus gray matter, you can see where the axons are running. And this is what builds our what we call our regions in the brain and our tracks in the brain. There's not a lot of cell bodies found in this. Additionally, when we talk about the central nervous system and the brain itself, uh, there's this cerebral spinal fluid that's also important to those tissues. This is a, a solution that's very similar to the plasma that we find in our blood and interstitial fluids. And it gets produced um, by the choroid plexus that's found in the ventricles of our brain. Okay, it gets secreted out, and as the the secretions are moved um, out of these out of the choroid plexus, they'll diffuse through the cells um, into like the plasma, the ventricles, and then uh, that water flows on its osmotic gradient and surrounds the entire brain. So we create this barrier of fluid that acts as both a barrier to uh, ion and other compounds transferring into the brain itself, as well as a protective layer. So it fills what we call um, the subarachnoid space, okay, between our arachnoid uh, membrane and the, and the pia mater. These are both membranes that encase you know, the pia mater encases the brain, um, and the arachnoid uh, membrane is, is superior to that. And again, their function is both a physical and chemical protection for the brain. It's permeable to brain capillaries, so our, our brain capillaries will feed into the cerebral spinal fluid, and uh, within this this tissue inter interaction, we have specialized cells called astrocytes that they they kind of form what we call tight junctions between the end of epithelial cells. So they increase the surface area and they limit what can actually pass through this, this barrier. So they protect the brain from any type of toxic water-soluble compounds and pathogens that could potentially be moving in. So bacteria, those types of things can't cross this. The only thing that can cross are small lipid soluble molecules. It can cross the, the blood brain barrier. So lipid soluble molecules like hormones, alcohol, um, those types of compounds that are able to freely move into um, or across the membrane. Additionally, when we talk about the central nervous system and the and the neurons that we found find within the central nervous systems, uh, we have to recognize that neural tissue itself has some very special metabolic requirements. Uh, because of the amount of membrane transport that goes on in neurons, uh, 
vis-a-vis -vis our sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride channels, neurons need a constant supply of oxygen to be able to undergo respiration to generate ATP, and they need a constant supply of glucose, again, to undergo respiration and derive ATP. So ATP is that power that's going to be needed for our sodium ATPase pumps, um, for axonal transport, for neurotransmitter synthesis, and other enzymatic reactions. So there's a very high demand for oxygen and glucose in the brain. Uh, uh, because of that, the brain receives 15% of the total blood that's pumped into the body, or, or pumped by the heart in the body, will go to the brain. So large portion of, of blood is being directed to the brain to supply it with oxygen. Oxygen can then pass freely across that blood-brain barrier. Um, and then glucose, it gets transported ac across by membrane transporters. It moves from the plasma into that interstitial fluid of the cerebral um, spinal fluid. And then uh, the brain then consumes the, uh, the overwhelming majority of, of uh, glucose that gets consumed. So half of the body's glucose is going to be consumed by the brain. That's how high the, en the energetic demands of this neural tissue is. Um, if you become, if, if you're diabetic, one of the, the main, main So when we talk about diabetics, one of the main concerns we have about a diabetic is that they'll have a drop in blood sugar uh, glucose concentrations. And when this happens, what that leads to is um, what we call hypoglycemia, in which the person becomes very confused, um, they uh, become, uh, their their movements become somewhat erratic, leads to unconsciousness, and then they'll go into a diabetic coma, right, in which you become unconscious, lead, can lead to death. The reason why you go into that coma is the brain isn't able to function, right? You have jerky movements because, again, the brain can't send signals through your, your somatic motor neurons to say, hey, let's have these, these movements. You get lightheaded. Um, you start to fall, right? Those things happen because of a decrease in glucose and the, and that leading to inability of this neural tissue to be adequately uh, supplied with with uh, ATP. Okay, so going back and looking at, um, we talked a little bit about brain, we talked about how we have gray matter, we have white matter. Um, the white matter in the brain is mostly found interior, okay, so on the inside and the gray matter is found on the exterior surface of the brain, like on the, on the outer regions. In the spinal cord, that's actually kind of reversed. We find our white mat matter is peripheral, okay, and the gray matter is, is more central. So if we look at a cross-section of the spinal cord, again, we'll see we have um, these cell bodies that are found in the interior. They make up what we call our, our horns, our dorsal and ventral horns. Uh, and then um, they're being fed in by uh, these, these afferent neurons that are coming from the body, right? We have these dorsal roots. They go in, they feed, and then the actual axon of then the, the neurons that are leading to the brain are running um, on the outside, peripheral, through the white matter, and they're leading to, to the brain. Uh, a unique aspect of our uh, of the spinal cords and how we look at what, what their, their function is, most of the spinal cords, again, are a relay station for sending information from the peripheral body directly to the brain. Most of this peripheral information, this afferent information, will move through our spinal cord. So we have a stimulus. That stimulus gets transduced, right, and, and turned into a neuronal signal. It comes in on a, a um, afferent neuron. 
uh, it comes in on an afferent neuron. And then, um, depending on what type of signal it is, it will either be transmitted to the brain, or oftentimes uh, what we have is a spinal reflex. So some information is is so important that the, the spine itself can act as an integrating center. So let's say, for instance, I held my hand over a flame. Okay, that triggers a nociceptor to send a pain response immediately into the spine. Um, there's going to be a a uh, synapse that occurs at a ganglion in which I will also relay that information to the brain in which I will then perceive pain. I'll feel that burning sensation. But at the same time, there's also interneurons that lead from, say, our dorsal horn, go to the ventral horn, and it initiates a spinal reflex with an efferent signal that moves to the muscles in, um, say, my, my bicep and causes me to retract my arm and pull it away from the flame. Um, and that response happens very, very quickly because it doesn't actually take the time of being sent all the way to the brain, brain being the integrating center, and then commanding that response. So a lot of our reflex responses that are super important either for um, our health and safety or for things about like balance, muscle coordination, like positioning, uh, we don't a lot of those things that are unperceived, that we don't aren't cognizant of, um, that don't require higher brain function, are dealt with in the spinal cord through a reflex. So if I stick my arm out, there's actually, you know, to the side, there's a spinal reflex that's going to have a counterweight on the other side of my body um, in which muscles will flex and I will uh, be able to maintain balance. Those occur as spinal reflexes. The brain itself functions as an integrating center and it is really involved in three main um, functions. The first is we could classify as a sensory system. So the brain is going to monitor both internal, external, stimuli, and then initiate reflex responses based off of um, the, uh, the needs of responding to those. Okay, so we're, we're collecting sensory information and responding to it. Uh, there's another system that we call the cognitive system. In the cognitive system, we're now, the brain is taking in information and initiating what we call voluntary responses. So thought responses that we think about. We are, we are cognizant of them, we recognize them, and we will them into action. And then the last system that the brain is, is involved in is what we call the behavioral state system. Okay, these behavioral state systems are pathways in the brain that govern our intrinsic behaviors, how we act. They, they, a lot of them are, are wrapped up in circadian rhythms and like sleep-wake cycles, and they govern the hormones, the responses that we, we circulate at different times um, and under different conditions. So these are the three brain functions, sensory, cognitive, and behavioral. The brain itself is comprised of a number of different regions that we can kind of break down. Um, the oldest region of, of the brain, or the most primitive, when I say oldest, I'm talking on an evolutionary aspect, so the most primitive part of the brain is the brain stem. It is uh, an extension of the spinal cord. Um, and out of the brain stem, 11 of our 12 cranial nerves extend. Uh, and the cranial nerves are the main nerves in which we are um, bringing in information and and um, and then also having both afferent and efferent signals being sent. Now, I don't uh, in anatomy. You guys will be responsible for learning these. Um, I am not going to quiz over cranial nerves, other than to say that the majority of our cranial nerves, eleven, come from the, the brain stem. So if we look at the brain stem itself. So here we see the spinal cord, and then the brain stem is made up of three main tissues, okay, that we kind of separate into different into different groups. The first is the medulla, okay, that's going to be the most inferior, followed by the pons, and you can see the pons right here, this blue region, and 
Then superior to the pons, we have the midbrain. And on the midbrain is where we have our, some accessory, accessory um, glands like the thalamus. The function of the medulla, okay, of the medulla oblongata is, is really to control involuntary functions. So things that we don't think about, like blood pressure, right? The control centers for blood pressure, for breathing, for swallowing, for vomiting, are all coordinated here in the medulla oblongata, okay? Um, a large portion of what you'll be tested over is being able to identify not visually, but identify um, these regions of the brain and their functions that go to them. So these these figures and, and um, the tables uh, that that correspond to them are really good for kind of putting these out. So in medulla oblongata, think involuntary functions like blood pressure, breathing, swallowing, vomiting, those types of things. As we move to the pons, the pons is really a relay station. Uh, this is where we take additional information um, that's coming from the spine, and then we relay it to the appropriate regions in both the cerebrum and the cerebellum. So you can think about it like your operator switchboard. Additionally, um, we also have integrating centers for breathing that occur in the pons as well. So medulla oblongata, but also in the pons. And finally, in the midbrain, uh, the functions that were really the, the, being primarily controlled in the midbrain are going to be eye movement. Um, we're going to have uh, an area in which we relay signals for hearing and, and, and reflexes associating with, with audio, video um, information. But really get that kind of eye movement, where we put our focus, how we turn our heads in response to a sound, that aspect is coming in in the midbrain. And, and you'll notice in the midbrain, is where we really have um, that protrusion from the of, the of the optic track of going to the brain, or going, sorry, going to the eye. The next issue of the, or the next structure of the brain we want to talk about is, the next region of the brain that we'd like to talk about is the cerebellum, okay? The cerebellum is what coordinates our movement. This is the second largest structure of the brain. Sometimes we refer to it as the little brain. Um, and here we process sensory information that we're that we're taking in from uh, touch, sight, uh, sound, and we coordinate that sensory information with the execution of movement. So here we have integrating centers that are really focused on things like maintaining balance and equilibrium. Balance is, is both a function of, of posture as well as uh, auditory um, cues that are coming in from the middle of the ear. And, and we take that and um, issue send out relay signals to different muscle groups to ensure that we're maintaining that, that balance and that movement and that we're moving a, 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 accordingly. So just remember cerebellum is associated with the coordination and execution of movement. Anytime we need to coordinate it, it's going to move through there. Um, as we go superior, so we, here's our brain stem. Okay, cerebellum is located on the back. Um, now we get to this, this new region of the brain in which we have what's called the diencephalon. And the diencephalon is this region right here. We've actually talked about some of the, the uh, regions and, and glands found within the diacephalon, but we have our thalamus, okay, which is located interiorly right here. Um, we have the hypothalamus, which we've talked about, right, um, that serves as our, our area in which we control homeostasis. Um, it's the center of our behavioral state, so things like, like hunger, thirst, um, our behavioral drives of, of um, happy, sad, they, they, they originate in these regions. 
right? And then it also influences a lot of our autonomic nervous system that we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, so thalamus and hypothalamus. Then we have a couple glands that are associated here too. So we have the penile gland. This is an endocrine tissue and this is where we get our melatonin from. You'll notice again it's it's closely associated with the hypothalamus, control of homeostasis, and, and the thalamus itself, which is a relay station in which we take this integrating set, center where we're getting information from the brain stem, from our motor system, from our muscles, and we're kind of deciding where does this need to go within higher functioning of the brain. Okay, so penile gland where we, we produce melatonin. Um, we have the pituitary gland that we've talked about both anterior and posterior and all the hormones that are being secreted from that. All of those are found in the diacephalon which is really the central region in the brain. A little bit more about the hypothalamus. So hypothalamus because it drives so much of our hormonal um, release within the body it is such an important region of the brain. It, the, the functions of the hypothalamus uh, include this activation of our sympathetic nervous system, so we'll, that fight or flight response um, really gets triggered here in the, in the hypothalamus. Um, it is really important in maintaining body temperature. So we talked about in our, in our case study and the relationship between the hypothalamus and the thyroid gland and how thyroid gland plays a huge role in, in a lot of these things of like body temperature, body osmolarity. Um, it, it controls reproductive function. So the release of, of oxytocin, the release of uh, our trophic hormones that control uh, follicular stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone that ultimately produce our testosterone, our estradiol, um, all of those are, are, are functions of the hypothalamus. Um, our satiety and feeding center, so we... So the hypothalamus also controls our food intake. Uh, when we talk about our gastrointestinal uh, system. We'll talk more about how the role the hypothalamus plays in glucagon, insulin release, and the control of our satiety center and our feeding centers. Uh, it interacts with our limbic system in the brain that influences behavior and emotion. Uh, it is the one of the main, uh, or it has influences on our, our cardiovascular center that's found within the medulla oblongata, so that involuntary control of the heart can be regulated through the hypothalamus as well. And then the part that you guys have already covered the most is that, that trophic hormones that get secreted um, by the anterior pituitary are controlled by the release of hormones in the hypothalamus itself. So that all of these functions make the hypothalamus an incredibly important uh, region of the brain and once we're maintaining normal body homeostasis and conditioning. So we've talked about our brain stem, the diencephalon, uh, the cerebellum, and how the cerebellum is controlling that, that uh, movement coordination and how we, we move around. Now let's talk about the largest portion of our brain, that of the cerebrum. And the cerebrum is where we now have higher brain functions. And when we say higher brain functions, really what we really mean is the functions associated with cognition and behavior states. So the cerebrum is, com is consisting of two hemispheres. Right, so you have a right and a left hemisphere of the cerebrum, and they're connected by what we call the corpus callosum, in which we have uh, information that can be passed between the two two hemispheres, uh, composed of gray matter, white matter, and that gray matter is going to make up 
what is known as the cerebral cortex, um, our basal ganglia, our limbic system, which, which the limbic system is that link between our cognitive function and our behavior states. Um, and, and our white matter, and all that gray matter is going to be found on the exterior, right? Then the white matter that's found mostly on the interior are uh, the bundle fibers that connect the different regions of the brain. So all of our interneurons that go from, say, the frontal lobe to the parietal lobe to the temporal lobe and, and back and forth, that's what's functioning there. Additionally, uh, within the cerebrum, uh, we have these four main lobes. Okay, so we have the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, okay, our occipital lobe, and then the temporal lobe. We'll talk about those functions in a sense in a second. These cortexes um, can be organized into what we call functional areas. So in each one of these hemispheres, right, and in each one of these cortexes, so whether it's the, the uh, uh, frontal, uh, parietal, um, temporal, or occipital, we'll find what we call sensory areas, in which this region of those, those lobes um, are where we take sensory input and we translate it into perception to where we're aware of it. So this where we have, we'd have a visual sensory area, an auditory sensory area, so on and so forth, right? Uh, we'll have motor areas in which now um, we take that perception and then it gets, gets translated over to the motor area and that motor area will then direct skeletal muscle movement. And again, this is skeletal muscle movement that we are aware of, that we perceive. So when you think about like, hey, I want to run, right? I want to walk, I want to stop, I want to go. Those things are all being controlled by the motor areas within the cerebral cortex. And then lastly, we have what are known as association areas. And these kind of marry the sensory and motor areas together. So it's here that we integrate information from both the sensory area and the motor area and we then can use that to direct what we call voluntary behaviors. And we'll get into our behavioral states in the brain. So just looking at these different regions again, um, let's kind of talk about what their main sensory areas, motor areas, and, and, and association areas are um, and what's kind of being done. So if we look at the frontal lobe, okay, in the frontal lobe, uh, this is primarily uh, dealing with skeletal muscle movement. That's what is being directed by the, the frontal lobe. So we have a primary motor cortex, right? And then we have a motor association area, sometimes we call it the premotor cortex. And we're coordinating all the information that we're receiving from um, other associations, other areas of the brain, even some of our behavioral states are being brought into the frontal lobe and then uh, we direct that skeletal movement from there. In the parietal lobe, we're now taking sensory information from both the skin, our muscles, um, viscera, taste buds, those areas, and we are utilizing those informations to dictate behavior and direct, um, direct uh, the, the movement that would then be passed to the frontal lobe. So um, the sensory association area is going to be bringing in stuff from like touch, um, balance, uh, our taste, okay? That's happening in the parietal lobe. The occipital lobe is coordinating vision. So we have a visual association area, we'll have a visual cortex, okay? Um, again, the cortex is kind of directing those movements of how we, um, we may then have a, a uh, like eye movements and changing stuff like that can be directed from here. That's the occipital lobe. So occipital vision, parietal taste, touch, right, frontal, skeletal movement. And then last, we have the temporal lobe. And the temporal lobe is going to be associated with both smell and hearing. So we have an olfactory cortex, an auditory cortex. There's also an auditory association area to where we can kind of push these things together. Um, we th these are, are kind of going on in in, in those in those areas.
So you will be tested over these four different lobes and what kind of sensory information is really being associated there and what motor information in the case of the, the frontal lobe is kind of occurring there. And all of these lobes, they, they work with each other, right? So even though visual association area cortex, right, we're sending through interneuron signals all throughout these lobes. So both our brain and the spinal cord are going to take sensory information that we receive from the body and we're going to then integrate it, right? Some of that integration in the spinal cord will just be with spinal reflexes, but uh, additional information uh, will be sent to the brain, um, to the primary somatic sensory cortex, and this is where we then um, start developing some of our pathways. So we have um, our somatosensory pathways, the things that we have like our touch, temperature, pain, itch, body position, they will travel through some of the same neurons, the same regions of the brains. We also have special sense pathways that lead to the visual cortex, the auditory cortex, the olfactory cortex, the gustatory cortex for taste. Um, so there's kind of these pathways that are, are leading in through our um, cranial nerves. And then we take that sensory information and it gets processed in our sensory areas and our association areas and we, from that processing, we then develop what we call perception, where we become aware of them and then modify our behavior and actions based off that. And the last part of this chapter that I want you guys to be familiar with, and I'm simplifying this down, your, your book goes into great detail about these, but there's four main, what we call a behavioral states that exist within the, the brain and these behavioral states are being directed by different neurons and different neurotransmitters that are being released. So the first one we want to talk about is what we call the, the noradrenergic path, behavioral state and pathway. And these are being directed by neurons that are releasing norepinephrine and the, the function of these regions in the brain, you'll see that they occur in the brain stem, um, diacephalon, cerebrum, um, cerebellum, and all of these regions, uh, their function is really to focus our attention, our arousal, our sleep-wake cycles, our, our learning and memory, um, and pain and mood. Okay, a, a lot of this is associated with the our flight and, and flight re, uh, reflexes in the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, where do they originate? They're going to originate in the pons. Okay, that's where the, the main neurons originate and then they terminate in all of these different regions, whether it's thalamus, cerebral cortex, olfactory bulb, all those. Okay, so I expect you guys to kind of know the main function, where it would originate, and perhaps where you'd have some termination. And there will be overlap between these. So our next one is what we call the serotonergic, and here the neurotransmitter that's being released is serotonin. Okay, and it's driving this behavioral state. And its function is really, um, there, there's two main pathways. There's what we call the lower nuclei and the upper nuclei. And the lower nuclei found in the, the lower brainstem are gonna be focused with pain and locomotion movement. The upper ones are gonna be associated with our sleep and wake cycles, our mood and emotional behaviors like aggression and depression. Okay, and you'll see where they originate is um, along these nuclei in the, in the brain stem in the midline, where they terminate. So the lower ones terminate in the spinal cord, and the upper ones are going to terminate um, pretty much all throughout the brain. Okay, so uh, all areas, that's where they'll, they'll kind of go. Next one we should talk about is our dopaner dopaminergic on which dopamine is the neurotransmitter being released and utilized along these pathways. Uh, the two functions of these, because we have two different or, or, um, regions in which it, it originates, um, is going to be motor control. And the second is going to be our reward centers. So this is really um, pathways that we know are linked to addictive behaviors. Uh, things like nicotine, um, uh, THC, alcohol can disrupt these reward centers. Um, even things like just um, 
Okay, where they originate, um, they originate again in the midbrain. They're not a little bit higher than the midline, but they're in the the um, ventral tangential and the substantia uh, nigra regions. Uh, those are the specific. I'm not going to test right on those, but again, midbrain. Um, and where they terminate is going to be in the uh, prefrontal cortex um, and other cortexes of, of the the uh, cerebrum. Okay, though some of the the second ones, the ones go to the reward center. You, you'll notice they go to the limbic system. Okay, in the diacephalon, mostly the basal nuclei. The last one is the cholinergic. And here, the, the neurotransmitter that's driving this system is going to be acetylcholine. And acetylcholine, again, you'll notice, again, a lot of these have this. They're, they're overlapping. Um, so you'll see sleep-wake cycles is found both in um, the serotonergic and noradrenergic as well as the cholinergic. Um, but again, we'll also have arousal, learning, um, memory, and then sensory information that's, that goes through the thalamus is being directed by the acetylcholine um, cholinergic pathways. Where does it originate? In the base of the, the cerebrum. So this is one of the few that actually will originate in the base of the cerebrum um, and in the pons and midbrain as well. Where does it end up? Well, a lot of it will go to the hippocampus and thalamus and then the rest will be in the cerebrum.